You're listening to the Better Two Podcast with DM Needham. Hi gang, Donna here. Today I talked to Mike Messier about his move from Connecticut to Florida. He did so right before the pandemic and he really didn't have a plan, but it ended up working out for the best. We also talk about his documentary filmmaking, pro wrestling, and several other things in between, including reality. So stay tuned. Hi Mike, how are you doing today? I'm great, Donna. Thanks for having me on your show today. I'm looking forward to talking with you. Good. So you decided that you needed a change of lifestyle, correct? And you just uprooted your life and decided yeah. to move to Florida. Yeah, I was in New England for quite some time. And uh, I, you know, some things happened. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't really want to say who, but some close people to me passed away. And um, that kind of lifted the obligation for me to remain where I was in New England. And uh, there was other reasons perhaps to stick around. You know, I had been building connections and experience with um, entertainment in various forms up there for quite some time, you know, doing dinner theater acting, making my own films, trying to get a bigger budget film produced at some point, but really kind of just spinning my wheels for quite some time. And to other folks, maybe I was doing well, but to my own set of standards and expectations, I wasn't. So, you know, the weather and everything else kind of just made me feel like I was way overdue to get out of there and, and make a move. And there was a lot of, uh, at least for me, a fair amount of pressure from family members and friends to stay there, not understanding why I would leave. But what I had to come to the conclusion, Donna, was this was my life, my decision. I was pretty miserable on many levels. And why be miserable? You know, life's too short to be miserable. So I had to kind of just stick to my guns or, or not even stick to them, create them and get going. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand. So why Florida? Well, a friend of mine um, had moved to Jacksonville, Florida about seven years before me. And he was a gentleman in his seventies, him and his wife uh, had moved there and he kind of did a good, did a good sell job uh, on it for me, you know, like selling me the city and, one thing that he said that that's resonated was he would only move to Jacksonville, Florida. He wouldn't move to any other city in Florida. And uh, I, I found that to be an interesting statement because most people think of Orlando or maybe Miami or Tampa. So for him to, and my friend, his name is Harrison. He did a, um, an evaluation of the whole world, apparently. Like he, he broke down like cost of living and, and weather and, and chances of getting hit by a hurricane and all these other statistical uh, things that he did. So he did a lot of the research uh, for himself, but he uh, started preaching to me about how great he was enjoying it. So in the uh, February of 2019, I started a road trip on Super Bowl Sunday, uh, driving from uh, Rhode Island, uh, first to Maryland, where a friend of mine put me up for the night and we watched the Super Bowl there. And uh, then continuing uh, through North Carolina, where I visited my old college in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I think I went to Savannah, Georgia for a night or two, night or two and eventually got to Jacksonville as a, um, as a exploration visit. So this was before I moved. And so I was in uh, Jacksonville for about two and a half weeks. I stayed at a pretty inexpensive uh, motel. Uh, that was an experience. And I explored what I could of the area and I did really enjoy it, you know, and I did really like it. And uh, then I came back and the initial thought was that I was gonna move in uh, 2020 at some point. But when I came back to Rhode Island, I, I was like, man, I, I think I wanna move this year. You know, I, I, and I made a, I, I sped up the game plan, so to speak. And I made it happen in uh, September of 2019. And uh, one test of that was a friend of mine had cast me in a film that he was producing in Texas. And he was buying like the Super Saver discount airline tickets, you know, eight months in advance of filming. 
and he wanted to know where to buy my airplane ticket from, you know, Rhode Island or Florida or what. And so that's really what I said, geez, I, this guy's expecting me to make a decision. I better commit. So I said, well, get the ticket from Jacksonville, you know, and once this other gentleman, uh, Jamie Reborn is his name, once he bought me an airline ticket from Jacksonville, Florida for October of 2019, and I'm still in Rhode Island and I haven't moved, well, that's when I really said, well, I guess I have to move now because I've got someone else's money uh, wrapped up into this thing. And, and sure, you could always change an airline ticket if you had to, but, but that kind of um, pressure or that uh, expectation was really a catalyst for me to get going. And I, I learned all the the things that come with moving, you know, from one state to another, which I hadn't done in quite some time and certainly hadn't done uh, spearheading my own project, so to speak. So did you end up going to Texas to work on this project? Yeah, yeah. No, I was able to move to Florida uh, in September of, of 2019. Uh, I had to make two round trips. I, I basically moved myself. I just packed my car full of stuff and made two round trips. And uh, my, you know, my sister did help me out quite a bit, um, but I, I had to pack my own stuff and just get the car moving and going. And I couldn't, um, I couldn't not get to Texas. So I did get to Texas as expected, and we shot the film and everything. So, awesome. So, do you think that you know? I know that you, you had done a lot of production in New England, in the New England area. So. Since you've moved, have you been able to still handle doing those things in Florida now? Well, there's had to be a modification, Donna. You know, um, I was here in Jacksonville for about five months when suddenly pandemic time came. So uh, the industry, the independent, you know, do-it-yourselfers, some have continued to do stuff. I didn't really build as many connections or, or friendships or whatever that I would have had liked to. Uh, before the pandemic st struck, I was still getting settled in my own mind. So I've kind of, you know, modified uh, my creativity to do things more that I can do on my own, uh, such as, you know, writing this novel here. You know, I, I kind of learned that, well, I can write scripts. I've been writing screenplays for a long time. Some get made, some don't. It's very frustrating when you write a script and it doesn't get made for, for whatever reason, usually money. Um, but what I can do is I can learn how to self-publish uh, novels on Amazon. And uh, that was something that had been tinkering around in my brain for years. In fact, I had even written this book in 2018, but I had not actually published it and looked into all the different ways that publishing groups offer to <laughs> work with writers. A lot of times they want you to pay them. Uh, a lot of money to get published with a lot of, uh, I would say, false promises and false hopes that they're going to make you a star writer. And I just did the research and said, man, you know, submitting my book or my novel to different publishing companies and writing query letters, this is far too much like the film world where you're always kind of exposing yourself and, and you know, groveling at the feet of production companies or whoever else or agents or, you know, it's always a, in the film world, there's always this feeling with the artists that not only do you have to do the art, but then you have to market yourself and grovel at the feet of these mighty companies. And I said, I don't want to go down that path with this novel. I, I if this is me, I'm writing this thing. Uh, let me figure out how to self publish. When I first attempted to do that on Amazon, I think they had a freeze for a while because of the pandemic. So they weren't it wasn't easy to self-publish initially. And then I just kind of let it go for four or five months. And I checked in later and suddenly it was working again, the self-publishing on, on Amazon I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what happened. You know, I've, I've put my energies more into writing and also memorizing a monologue. Uh, you watch the Disregard the Vampire, a Mike Messier documentary uh, piece before our interview that's available on YouTube for all your watchers to watch it. The character in that piece, the antagonist, has kind of been volleyed around by two other actors at this point, and I'm just going to do it myself. You know, I, I'm, I've, already, I've memorized the monologue of that character, uh, Jean Lacroix Distance, and uh, I've grown my hair out longer, and I've grown this, you know, goatee and mustache to give the character more of the look that I think would be appropriate. Normally, my hair is not this long, and so I just figured 
why am I giving this great role to other actors who aren't following up on it? Why don't I follow up on it myself? So are you planning on redoing that project then? Yeah, you know, and the first step, Donna, is, um, like I said, from, from the book, uh, Distance from Avalon, I've memorized a monologue mm -hmm. from the antagonist character, right. John LaCroix Distance, and I've memorized that, and I filmed it just a week ago, actually, in my backyard here, kind of as a, as a rough draft, but now I'm going to enlist uh, somebody to film it, whether it's on a cell phone or a better camera, hopefully, and uh, I'll take on this project, and uh, the monologue will be kind of a proof of concept, is what they call it, you know, and, and I'll just keep keep digging away at it. You know, the other thing is, I've been doing YouTube for three years, didn't really realize that there could be money to be made on YouTube. I always kind of did YouTube half-heartedly, not really expecting anything of it, but once I did some research once again because of the pandemic you know like you're, you're you start thinking what can i do with my life and uh one thing that i realized is wow i only need a thousand subscribers to start getting into the ballpark of monetization and of course there's more to it but the the bottom thing the, the first step is a thousand subscribers and at the time i probably had 300 subscribers kind of by chance so then i said well what's my attempt or what's my game plan to get a thousand subscribers? And I started doing more research on that, you know, and there's, there's so many people on YouTube already that have advice YouTube video channels to get more subscribers for you. So, and there's this application called TubeBuddy, which I had never heard of until I did this research. And, and one of these people, I think her name was Sunny, mentioned TubeBuddy. And of course she had a referral link and, and I went ahead and signed up to, to give her a chunk of change because she gets a, a bonus when I sign up and I try it. It's a month to month subscription. It's working for me. You know, now I have 876 subscribers and a year ago I had about 300. So it's not a million subscribers, but I, I feel like I'm just getting started, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about some of your projects. What there was a project that was, oh, wrestling. Wrestling with Sanity? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a project that people, you know, if they're more visually, uh, you know, entertained, the short film series, Wrestling with Sanity short film trilogy is 33 minutes and that's up on YouTube. And uh, on Mike, on the, the channel is called Subscribe to Mike Messier YouTube channel. So, People can watch it at any time. The actors, uh, Mark Carter, Mauro Canepa, Irina Pellegrad did a great job. I'd still love to get that project fully made. Uh, the pro wrestler Raven at one time agreed to be in it. Um, the, the problem, I guess, with that project, like a lot of projects is show me the money. You know, like I didn't have the money and I still don't as of this minute to give that script the integrity that it deserves which would not be millions of dollars, but I would say a $250,000 budget would be great for that movie, uh, but maybe more because the pandemic is causing movies to increase in budget because of all the things you have to do, you know, with, with uh, protocol. So uh, that was one of those things, Donnell, that was a frustration. It was like, hey, I'm putting four or five years into trying to gain this movie produced. I have supposed producers who are more or less friends of mine, but people that claim to be producers showing an interest and then they kind of float off and do other things. Uh, that was a frustration, to be honest with you. I, I worked on a low budget TV show um, as an actress, then turned into marketing, then turned into a whole being the line producer and having wearing several other hats, including handling the budget. And we produced six episodes for $200,000. But that also was the marketing up marketing bit too. And quite honestly, we didn't have enough money and it went absolutely nowhere. So I understand the frustration. Yeah, it is frustrating, especially when as the creator, in this case, me, it's like uh, you feel like you're letting people down, you know, and that's one of the um, themes of that documentary, disregard the vampire Mike Messier documentary is the feeling of letting people down and what to do to get beyond that feeling and to actually make something happen. You know, 
Yeah. I mean, being a creative, it, it is, it is a hard thing to do because you have to be creative. You have to, you have to have the funds. You have to be able to market it. You are a, dare I say, a one person show when you decide to take it out on your own and be an independent. Yeah. And, and for what I'm trying to do, Donna, with the, the YouTube thing is I'm hoping to get the, I already have the watch hours are, are in range to be profitable. I need to, I need to get those remaining 124 subscribers. Uh, and so if anyone listening to this or watching this on YouTube wants to subscribe, it's subscribe to Mike Messier YouTube channel. And what I tell people is, you know, on my channel, there's, there kind of is something for everybody, but not everything I do is going to be for everybody. I have a lot of original stuff. The Messier mantra, I think, is my TV show that I did in Massachusetts. I've got holistic healers. I've got other actors, writers, a boxing promoter. I did about 150 episodes of that TV show. It's an interview show. I think people would love that show. That's pretty mainstream. But my pro wrestling rants and the Suicide Girls burlesque and, uh, you know, Fozzie in concert the other day and beach wrestling, these kind of more uh, niche things. I'm not expecting every subscriber to watch these things. But if they do subscribe to my channel and they dig around, I think they'll find something that they do enjoy. So have you have you explored TikTok since it is a visual medium? Well, I got turned off from TikTok TikTok when there was some type of allegation of, of Chinese uh, propaganda or Chinese um, uh, observations of the users. Am, am, am I mistaken or was that a thing for a while? There was mention of it. But apparently, uh, then if I remember correctly, they were forced to, in order to stay in the country, they ended up having to have somebody in America buy part of it. I guess that turned me off to it, to be honest with you. I didn't want to do it after I heard about that. Fair enough. I just was thinking because it's a visual medium that that would be something. And Instagram now has reels, which is very similar to what TikTok does. Yeah, what I what I found for me, Donna, is... Um, I, I, like, for instance, YouTube just started this shorts thing, hashtag shorts, mm -hmm. where it's like either 15 seconds or a minute, and it's kind of a way to get your stuff out there to more people. And I've been doing some of those. I think for me, I kind of like the, the longer running content thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really into this has got to be 15 seconds or less. I'd rather do a, a little bit longer or a lot longer, to be honest with you. It's just a stylistic thing. It's nothing against shorter pieces. I'm just more of a longer guy. So when did you start as an actor? Cause I, I'm looking at the, you know, I was looking at your resume and it was talking about some of the films and television you worked on. So when did you start as an actor? Well, I can remember being a, a little kid and we would literally have um, puppet shows with sandwich bags in first grade. And uh, for, for whatever, I like doing that, you know? And then uh, I think in, fifth grade I was in the school or third grade the school play was uh, Stone Soup so me and a, a kid named Greg Vire I still remember his name we played like the the French soldiers or whatever in Stone Soup but I think it, it kind of got dormant for me as an actor until the end of college uh, a friend of mine and I um, got together and made a movie called Man and You a Providence Love Story which is an 80 minute movie it took us a year and a half to make uh, my friend George Lamastro and I uh, used the school's mini DV cameras, which at the time were the big thing. And uh, our school was not a film school. It was just a regular Rhode Island college. And we just kind of made a movie for no budget. And it took us a year and a half to make this 80 minute movie. And the point is I, I cast myself as the lead. <clears throat> and um, that was kind of my on the job training. You know, so that was that was the probably the first thing that I did. And, and around the time I started taking a playwriting class in college and in the playwriting class, because I was an English major with a creative writing concentration. A lot of my co-students in that class were in the theater department at the college and you would kind of take turns uh, acting out everybody else's scripts. And uh, I just. A friend of mine, Lenny Schwartz, in the class would give me scripts to read. Nobody else really did because I wasn't a theater major. I wasn't in their clique, so to speak. And I just kind of saw, Donna, that I'm, I think I'm about as good as an actor as anybody else in here. You know, like in this class full of theater majors, I didn't feel that I was better, but I didn't feel that I was worse. 
So at the same time, I was kind of doing that movie. Then I took a, an acting course at a place called Perishable Theater in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, the, the teach, it was an introduction class, but the teacher was pretty hard on everybody. We started with 20 students and ended with about eight, you know, like yeah. <laughs> of the eight that finished the class. So I was like, this is an intro class, but, um, you know, uh, ironically, I've worked with the teacher since he's a good, he's a good guy. It was just, it was kind of like a boot camp for, for an intro to acting class. Uh, but I, I just started getting the acting bug there. And uh, I had an HBO audition in 2002 for a pilot that never hit the air, but that was a vote of confidence. Just the fact that HBO flew me from Rhode Island to meet Jay Roach, who directed Meet the Parents and and uh, Austin Powers. You know, I'm auditioning for him and I'm kind of new into this whole world. That was a boost of confidence. Although the show did not hit the air, I still felt good about the experience. I used some of that experience for uh, Rejected by Reality, which was, uh, 25 minute doc I did at the time, which was about me being rejected by reality TV shows. You know, one thing I learned along the way, Don, I guess pretty quick was, uh, you know, if I'm going to be rejected or if I'm going to be turned away from something, I'm going to try to turn that around to make it work for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to try to learn something from the experience or at least get a laugh out of it, if nothing else. So rejected by reality was kind of an early thing for me that I was rejected by the Jerry Springer show, the World Wrestling Entertainment, and the HBO thing fell apart. But I'm gonna make a 25 minute movie about it, which I think it got four and a half stars on Film Thread at the time, because I'm not gonna let their judgments or their lack of follow through on their own project stop me from getting something out of this experience. So looking back now that you moved, you really didn't have a plan when you moved. You just you just kind of did it. Has has it met your expectations of what you thought it would be? Well, I think you know going back to the title of your podcast, "Better to Podcast," is is it better to or not to type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, clearly, because Rhode Island was hit so hard by the pandemic, like the, I, I went up there in April of twenty twenty one to do a movie, and I was happy to do it but I'm looking around and the movie theaters are closed permanently up there. You know, the movie theaters that were there since the eighties. And I worked at, I worked at that movie theater when I was in college and now it's done. Well, here in Jacksonville, you know, there's, there's three movie theaters I go to on a regular basis within driving distance. Um, went up to new England, Rhode Island and try to go to a Starbucks and there's a security guard making sure that people don't hang around the Starbucks too long. You've got to get your coffee to leave. So I'm, I'm not trying to pick on the state, but I'm saying I would have gone nuts, you know, and I had some neighbors, you know, on a very real level here, I had neighbors that I'm sure that they went pretty close to insane during this pandemic because they were pretty close to insane without the pandemic. So I'm like, I'm glad I wasn't going through this experience with them. Yeah. You know, yeah. so the answer is, yeah, most definitely, I'm glad I moved when I did. I was able to go to Disney uh, a few times because they've been open with, you know, masks and temperature checks. But I kind of enjoy the smaller crowds, to be honest with you. I'm like, hey, I can go to this amusement park and, and, and escape from the tragedies that our world is going through. So I, without a doubt, it was the right move to make in retrospect. So... What do you see coming up for you? What's your next project going to be? Well, I'm, like I said, I'm working on this monologue from you know a distance from right. monologue. Right. I've got it memorized, and basically, hopefully, within a week or two, I, I need a better shirt. Like I, you know, once I'm a, kind of a, kind of a big guy, so I need like a bigger shirt, and it's it, it's a costume piece. It needs to be like a a Renaissance shirt or something with some style. So I'm kind of on the lookout for a shirt. I'm on the lookout for uh, someone with a camera to film it. I've been talking to someone in St. Augustine, Florida to do that. And then I'm, I've got Fighter Play Basketball, which is another screenplay of mine uh, that I'm converting to uh, Kindle. Kindle on Amazon has this new uh, book thing going on where they're, uh, you're encouraged to write a book in installments, kind of like the Stephen King, uh, The Green Mile from the 90s. Like yeah. instead of writing the whole book and releasing it once, uh, your minimum is 600 words at a time. 
So I'm sure many people are just taking some book they've written and not published and just copying and pasting 600 words or a thousand words at a time. But I'm actually doing it the hard way. I'm writing the book in live time and then publishing it. So Fight or Play Basketball is on that forum. I think people can get the first three installments for free and then decide whether or not they want to continue reading. And I'm working on the uh, the sequel to this one, The Distance from Avalon. I'm writing the sequel now as well, which I've taken a little bit of a break on to do the fight or play basketball. So um, there you have it. Okay. So are you going to be doing any more film production after after what you're working on? I mean, I know this is the big project. Are, are you working on another script as well? Or are you just going to focus on writing on Vela for the the flight or fight basketball? Well, I, I, you know, here's the thing. I mean, I, a friend of mine has has offered me a role in a movie that he's making in September in Rhode Island, probably a one day, you know, day player role, which I'll go up for that. I, you know, as between writing the sequel to this one uh, and writing the, the fight or play basketball on the Kindle, <clears throat> I think that's enough. I think, um, you know, for me, one thing it's it's true with a lot of people it's what's the new idea what's the next thing well i always be a finisher finish the thing you're working on now before you go off and do five other things and i've had a problem with that as the doc explains you know and, and a lot of my friends and associates have the same problem it's always it, like a, a need to film but not a responsibility to edit you know, and it gets frustrating when all these films are floating around on computers and hard drives, yet no one seems to take a, a couple of months to sit there and do the hard work, which is the editing, you know, and, and that gets frustrating. So for me, Donna, my thing now is, you know, I got enough to, to write. I, I really just have to write what I've already started. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You had a, a film festival, didn't you? Yeah, I still do. Avalonia Festival. Uh, and once again, it's all a tie-in, you know, people have to show the book 20 times, but they look at the word Avalon right. and then you put IA at the end of it. Avalonia Festival <clears throat> is a derivative from distance from Avalon, you know, so the Avalonia Festival will have its sixth event in uh, November of 2021. We actually did have a live event, you know, because a lot of film festivals were doing the, uh, excuse me, no problem. a lot of film festivals were doing web only but here in florida we could do live events if if done in a certain way and just kind of knowing that my event um avalonia festival five I, I found a venue that had a room to put the big screen tv and to have chairs for everybody and have an open door in the back so that the air can circulate well i, I figured that's about as good as i can get for for protocol right i mean to have a room where you can actually watch the the movies and have chairs <clears throat> and have an open door for air circulation. I did the live event. You know, a lot of film festivals that I entered and other people entered, suddenly you discover you're not gonna have a film festival to go to. You're just gonna have a website to look at. And I, I really, for me, although, you know, understanding about the whole thing, but I feel like that's not giving people their money's worth. If they spend 20 bucks or 10 bucks or five bucks, to enter Avalonia Festival with the idea that there's gonna be a live event. If there's any way to do a live event, I'm gonna do it and I did it, you know? So there was a live event at, uh, at Ormond Beach uh, at the uh, art gallery there. So there will be an Avalonia Festival 6 and uh, people can go to avaloniafestival.com. And uh, I did do a photography festival this year as well. You know, I discovered another thing that, hey, you know, why not have photography? You know, why not have a festival? And that one was web only, but it was advertised as web only. And uh, that really came out pretty well. I mean, there's so many great photographs that people were making and I don't see a lot of uh, photography festivals out there, at least in my circles. I'm not a professional photographer, but I can tell a good photograph when I see it. And my uh, judge from Japan, Kazuya, did a great job helping me to judge these photographs. And that's on Avalonia Festival as well. So if you could play the what if game, where do you see yourself in five years? That's a great question. Um, I really like to have this, uh, I see the distance from Avalon as being a trilogy of books. So I'd like to have them completed. And I'd really love within five years to have 
one of these projects, if not two or three, you know, in the production stages, if not completed, whether it's fighter play basketball or a distance from Avalon, you know, something bigger to come would be great. And, uh, but I, what I've kind of learned is I can't control everything. I can't control Steven Spielberg or Paramount Pictures or Lionsgate discovering Mike Messier's scripts or whatever. And I can't control if people in the business tell me they're gonna do something and sometimes they do and a lot of times they don't. But what I can control is the writing myself. You know, I can, can, I can control whether or not I write the fight or play basketball on this Kindle uh, new thing. I can control doing that. I can control if I self-publish these books, but I'm not in control of the whole world as much as I'd like to be. Uh, so just doing what I can do. How do you, how do you think, or how do you feel about the fact that now for a filmmaker or television producer, there are so many different avenues now of ways to put your message out. I'm not just talking YouTube. I'm talking Netflix. I'm talking, but you have all the streaming services. So there's a lot of opportunity there. It's, I know it's a hard thing to find the right person to get in touch with, but what do you think about that? I mean, do you consider it a blessing or a curse because now there are so many avenues? I think it's a blessing. I think it's whenever there's more distribution, you know, more ways of getting content uh, or getting your content to people, that's for the better of the artist, especially if you're not born, you know, a Barrymore or a Coppola, you know, if you're outside of the, and look, like a lot of businesses, there's nepotism in Hollywood. You know, people make a big deal if someone's kid is doing something yet you could go to any community college and see a bunch of talented kids doing a lot more things, right? So there's some nepotism to the Hollywood world. So anytime you kind of even the odds or the, the playing field a bit by having more distribution, more channels, uh, more streaming, YouTube, Vimeo, whatever, that's for the betterment of people like me who weren't born into a Hollywood family. So, when you were younger, did you see yourself being a filmmaker? I'm talking as a kid. Uh, my, the first time I can remember somebody asking me <clears throat> what I wanted to do with my life, I think it was probably my mom. And I, I think I responded to sportscaster. So for whatever reason, I, I thought like being a sportscaster on TV would be fun. There was a guy named George Michael, who was a big deal in the DC area when I was a kid, legendary Channel 4 News Sportscast. Just seemed to be a great guy who had a lot of fun. So for whatever reason, I thought it would be fun to be him. That didn't, it, I, I never pursued that when I got older, but um, I do like sports. I like watching sports, but that's, you know, I think the film thing came more with uh, teens and college time. But maybe when you think about it, your analysis of wrestling or your rants, as you were calling them on YouTube, maybe that's kind of a nod to the sportscaster in you. Yeah, I definitely, I, I did some color commentary recently for a show uh, here in Florida, uh, FEW, um, uh, Future Evolution Wrestling. I did the color commentary. I used to do commentary for Top Row Promotions out of Fall River, Mass. Uh, I've interviewed Bob Backlund, Ox Baker, who was this legendary pro wrestler, was a great friend of mine. I interviewed Ox a year before he passed away. And uh, that movie, Ox Baker, one of the boys is on my channel. And, um, you know, I, I sure, I love pro wrestling, mixed martial arts as a spectator. I learned at one point, I did wrestle a few matches myself, <clears throat> but I learned that I didn't like getting hurt, well, quite honestly, you know, like, although it's whatever you want to call wrestling, pre, you know, predetermined, but the guys still get hurt. I wrestled about 13 matches, and then I lost a retirement match, and I, I never came out of retirement. You know, I honored that retirement stipulation because... I, I didn't like getting dropped in my head, to be quite honest with you. My, 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 my feeling was that the strongest muscle in my body is my brain, and I'm going to try and protect that. So allowing guys to hit me in the head with a chair or DDT me or suplex me was not something I wanted to do. Yeah, I mean, everybody talks about wrestling being fake and that it's scripted, that there's a script that they follow, like in the bigger matches and stuff. And, and I do remember as a, a kid – our teen my mom used to take me because my grandmother loved wrestling we actually went to some of the wrestling matches and saw junkyard dog and andre the giant some of those older school wrestlers 
and there was a lot of talk about it being fake back then. But you're still, even if it's fake, you're still going through those motions and you're still hitting that mat. And it's not, I mean, it can't be easy on the body. No, and, and unfortunately, uh, Donna, we've seen a lot of the wrestlers of my generation and guys like Ravishing Rick Rude, uh, you know, passed away. Kurt Henning passed away. Guys that wrestled in their prime in their 20s and 30s, in their 40s and 50s, they're dropping dead left and right. You know what I mean? So uh, it's sad because you wonder about wh what what caused them to die so young. Was it concussions? Was it the pills, the pain pills they had to take to deal with this crazy business they're in? And there's a, there's a whole bunch of things there. Uh, JYD passed away in a car accident, which was unfortunate. That could happen to anybody. But it's just sad when you see some of your heroes dying young and it makes you wonder, man, I really liked watching that guy wrestle and he took some ch shots to the head with a chair. Did those chair shots lead to this guy's early death? And if you think about it that way, it's it's harder to enjoy w watching the pro wrestling because then you feel a little guilty. Like, man, am, is, is my enjoyment of this thing leading to these guys dying? You know, who knows? But a lot of people don't look at it that way. They, they are first to judge football. And I'm not saying you shouldn't. I've watched some football, not... But the impacts on football are hard, but they at least have some protection. A wrestler has none. And a chair, I mean, if somebody hits you with a chair, I'm sure it hurts like hell. Right. It does. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, some ways they can put their hands up to block it a little bit. But <clears throat> the reality is getting hit with a chair is getting hit with a chair. You know, I've got, I've got a match on tape somewhere that I was at where Bubba Ray Dudley a chair and he hit this guy named Bobby Duncombe Jr. with it and I thought I just watched an assassination attempt the, the wow. match was stopped right away they, they never even had the match he hit him with the chair before the bell started and he, he cracked him with the chair and it was just a sickening uh, sickening noise of, of metal on bone skull bone and so anyway, I still love pro wrestling, but what I do with the angry wrestling fan is what I call my persona online. I challenge the wrestling fans, especially the WWE fan. The WWE, which you know used to be called the WWF, they're such a monopoly, but they've done things that I don't politically agree with. They, they do shows in Saudi Arabia, you know, at the behest of the Saudi Arabian government for big money. They funded, they, as in Vince McMahon and his wife, Linda McMahon, funded Trump's 2016 campaign. You know, they were the biggest funders of Trump. And my point is, I don't like to mix my wrestling with politics. And I find that if the wrestling fans are funding the WWE, then the McMahons who own the WWE are funding Trump. Trump's giving Linda McMahon a, a important job. Uh, to me, I don't want my wrestling money or my wrestling uh, a fanhood supporting any politician. And I find that that's a breach of trust, to be honest. And I confront the wrestling fans with that uh, on my YouTube videos and in Facebook wrestling groups. And suddenly I'm the bad guy because a lot of wrestling fans want to bury their head in their sand. They think that it's just uh, fun and games. They don't realize that their attention to wrestling is funding things that they may not agree with themselves, but they try to put a blind spot on it because this is their escapism from reality. And I question people, can you ever really escape reality? The answer is probably not. You, but you can look at it in a lot of different ways just besides that. I mean, there's certain issues with, you know, let's look at the Cosby show. Sure. Everybody liked the Cosby show. Everybody thought Bill Cosby was funny. Then when this came out, and granted, I know, I know he's out of jail. I understand that, folks. I get everything. Don't come at me. All I'm saying is there's sometimes we don't know. What, we want the entertainment. We want the escape. And I'm not defending the fans that are, are doing this. I'm not a wrestling fan. But sometimes they just don't even care to know that. And that's the, that's the whole fact of the matter. We are bombarded with information so much that we want to stick our head in the sand and ignore what what the wizard's doing behind the curtain. Sure. We just want to see the big head. I went to see a, a film like in the movie theaters here 
they've been showing what they call the comeback classics, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what movie it was, if it was uh, some movie from the 90s, Dead Poets Society or, or um, you know, something like that. And then the movie, it says, produced by the Weinstein Company, you know? <laughs> and so it's like, yeah. if we're going to retroactively say, you know, Me Too movement and uh, Weinstein's a creep and Weinstein's a jerk, and okay, folks, do you want to give up um, your Matt Damon movies, your Ben Affleck movies, your uh, Ashley Judd movies, all the movies that you saw, Frida with Salma Hayek? I mean, th these women tell these stories about this abuse of Weinstein and what they had to go through in order to get Frida produced and Ashley Judd, you know, what they endured. Well, should we crumple up these films and throw them in the garbage can and, and take them off the internet? And because Weinstein's involved, I don't know. Well, the, we can take this back to right after 9-11, that there was a lot of talk after 9-11 about taking the towers out of any New York landscape from any old movies. Right. I don't think they actually did it, but there was a lot of talk about that. And, you know, here, here's, a, here's the way to, to look at this. Is erasing the past going to solve the problem? Or is the, or is the past being there a teachable moment. Yeah, and you know what? To go back to wrestling with that, there was a, the WWE recently <clears throat> made a deal with the Peacock streaming service, which is owned by NBC. Well, Peacock is now censoring some of the old wrestling stuff from the 80s. And there's a good, for example, Roddy Piper, probably a, a silly move, but he, he wrestled an African-American wrestler named Bad News Brown at WrestleMania six. So to promote this match, Roddy Piper painted himself half black because he was trying to make a point that it doesn't matter if you're black or white, we're all wrestlers or we're all tough guys or whatever he was trying to do. But Roddy goes into the ring and he's, he's doing Michael Jackson moves and he's, he's, he's really making a, a spectacle of himself. And at the time, 1990, they just thought, well, that's Roddy being crazy Roddy. You know, it's just, just Roddy being nuts. They even made an action figure of Roddy painted half black and half white. So <clears throat> now we flash forward to 2021. The Peacock Network has removed that match from WrestleMania 6. So if you're watching WrestleMania 6, you won't see Roddy Piper. You won't see Bad News Brown. Uh, you won't see Roddy Piper dressed in half black makeup uh, because the Peacock has determined that that is... Uh, not sensitive or insensitive or racist. And look, I wasn't there. I'm, I wasn't making those decisions. But as a fan, to me, Roddy Piper is one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. Did he make a silly, stupid move here with this painting? Yeah, he did. But it was part of the show. Millions of people have seen it. Why are we pretending it didn't happen? But how many things in the, you know, we can go to Oklahoma for that. How many people of us, you know, the o Oklahoma massacre, how many people even knew about that, that, you know, nobody did. It was all hidden. You know, Central Park, we all had this notion of what Central Park was or is, but it wasn't that way at one point. So we've sanitized history and we continue to do so. And so therefore, if you're sanitizing history while you're while you're opening up the proverbial kettle of worms here, it always comes back out. The truth always comes back out. Just because, for instance, they took that off, but yet you and I are having a conversation about it. You and I are having a conversation about the wrestling match. Right. So it's still part of a conversation. It's still part, it's still, people still know about it. Yeah, and, and that's true. And I mean, there's a guy on YouTube, Dane Calloway, that does these really powerful documentaries. Uh, mostly about, not mostly, but a lot about slavery and, and the things that we take uh, as, as gospel. Reality, we don't really know what happened, you know, because a lot of these historical records have been changed or warped or thrown in the garbage. So a lot of things that we learn in school books that we take as gospel may have just been someone's opinion or someone's guess as to what happened. So it's, it's tough, you know, and for me, what I try to get through to the wrestling fans, Donna, is if you're going to fall for this stuff just coming from wrestling, what will you fall for in real life? 
You know, like if, if you're going to allow this wrestling company, the McMahons, to push you around and influence your thinking on something like pro wrestling where they can't even decide their own history books, what will you allow reality to screw with you on? But there, there's two things here, though. When you're talking about the history books, one state controls the rest of the country's history, what we have in our history books. Texas is a big state who actually decides the curriculum curriculum for the textbooks. That's gone on for a long time. I don't know why, but that's gone on. And when you think about it, I had American history my junior year. How can you learn 200 plus years of history in 365 days? And you're not even at school for 365 days. So you can't really learn enough about what's going on in our country and in our world to be able to make a real judgment, to know the facts. But we're being forced to learn as, as the, the statement goes, to the victor goes the spoils. Right. So the victor gets to write history. Yeah. History is written by the winners. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we can't, we can't fault the education system, but then we need to look at the bigger picture and have it more balanced. It can't just be this little minutia of here's white history, because basically that's what we're teaching in school. Sure. Yeah, that, 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 like I said, you know, that guy, Dane, first name is D-A-N-E Calloway. He's got a really thought-provoking uh, YouTube channel that has some awesome stuff. I've never met the guy. I just watch his stuff, but I feel like I'm kind of learning to challenge uh, things that I've learned in my life by watching some of his stuff because he, he talks about some real inconsistencies with how the world has been uh, presented to us. And uh, in turn, I guess I, I try to challenge the wrestling fans or whoever else, you know, challenge some of the things you've learned. You know, Spike Lee did the same thing with movies, going back to do the right thing and she's got to have it. You know, Spike consistently makes movies that people have to have a conversation that maybe they don't want to have. Um, I just saw this movie called The Summer of Soul about this uh, New York Music Festival in 1969 that was overshadowed and um, basically buried because everyone talks about Woodstock, but this music festival that had Stevie Wonder and all these un other wonderful acts, uh, that happened too. And nobody even thought about it until now when this documentary came out 40 years later or whatever it is, 50 years later. Well, there was a documentary on, on Netflix about crack cocaine. And the interesting thing about it is I was in school in the 80s and I took a home and family living course and a child development course. And because, you know, that was required for girls to do stuff like that. And they talked, they showed us the movies of crack addicted babies. Well, the documentary was very eye opening because it talked about how the government helped supply the drugs and how the police were part of this and that the addiction was not as bad for crack, the crack addicted babies were not such an epidemic that they made it out to be. I mean, I've met people that, um, there was a lady I met who talked about, and I think she was from Central America. Her, her parents originally were from Central America and they were here. And she basically became part of the Brown Baby Project back in the 60s. So she was adopted out to somebody. They took her and she was adopted out. So, I mean, I had never heard of this. And that's the thing, when you start talking to people, I think because we are, the one benefit about us being so connected is you do find out more information that you may not have known. You do see things in a different light because, well, wait a second, how is this, you know, how is this related to what I know? And when you, and when I, you were talking about reality, Let's let's step back for one movie that you would think is not anything that should make you question reality, and that would be The Matrix. You look sure. at The Matrix, the full Matrix, you're thinking it's an action movie. But by the end of that movie, if you were really paying attention, you stopped and said, wait a second, is how do I know this is real? Yeah, and that blue pill, red pill motif has become a big thing. But it's true. Yeah, that, that's become a big metaphor for people you know, taking one of these pills will wake you up to a different form of consciousness. If only it were that simple. Do well, you, do you're you, right. 
And, and, and one thing is that it can be overwhelming. You know, you can you can go down so many rabbit holes on YouTube and find yourself. You know, here's a thing that I <clears throat> I don't like to think of conspiracy theories as they're not necessarily right. They're not necessarily wrong. I mean, you have to look at the evidence. And you know, when when JFK was shot and killed initially, you you would be called a a liar or a crazy person if you thought there was a conspiracy, if you thought that there was one more more than one gunman. Now most people think it was more than one gunman. Well, what happened? You know, what happened in the thirty or forty or, or so years since he was shot and killed? What changed? Because because the same thing happened one way or the other, but right. it's people's interpretation or their discovery of events or their suspicions. You know, at one point, if if you were around during World War One or World War Two, you'd be you know off to sign up to go serve and off to defend against the bad guys. But come Vietnam, suddenly people had different thoughts. You know what I mean? Suddenly people weren't they were you know running off to Canada or whatever. What what changed? Something changed. But but uh, people were still dying in overseas, regardless. So I mean, there's there's something there. But if, like I said, these YouTube videos they can drive you nuts because you start questioning things. Was Katy Perry is Katy Perry Lisa Benoit Ramsey? You know what I mean? Like that's a good one. Yeah. Right? There's all these things like I don't know. Well, I mean, p part of it when you think about it, part of it is a wicked game of telephone. Sure. You remember the game of telephone when we were yeah, when you're a kid? Yeah. Around. Yeah. And I mean, by the time you got to the end, it was nothing about what was said initially. Right. So, you know, we tend to change things. I recently had somebody reach out to the show who wanted to be a guest, and I I ended up passing because I didn't necessarily agree with what his thinking was. While it would have been an interesting topic, I felt that he might be do doing a disservice to some people. And so therefore I passed and I could have jumped on. Oh yeah, he's got a great thing. It'll be great for ratings. It'll get listeners listening. But I also looked at it as if he tells, if he says something to somebody and it was talking about medications and stuff, if he says something to somebody and they listen and something ends up hurting them because they decided to stop this, I'm not, I don't want to be responsible for somebody hurting somebody else this is the better to podcast it's supposed to help people not harm them and i couldn't take that risk so you know very much like a conspiracy theory i could get somebody on here and let's talk conspiracy theories go for it but sure. if i don't if i feel it's gonna end up harming somebody then i don't want them on the show yeah well that's you, you are showing integrity with your content and that's good and you know what i what i question myself and other people is how do we spend our time you know and i have issues with that too of course you know like if i'm if i'm watching a three-hour pro wrestling show and then i just get frustrated because wow they didn't you know book which means who wins and who loses mm -hmm. they didn't do this show the way i would have done it or i'm better you know i could be a better ring announcer than who they've got or whatever i'm just spending three hours of my time getting frustrated and angry about something where I could have watched a, a, a documentary, I could have read a book. I mean, I've got 200 books that I, I brought with me from Rhode Island to Florida, and I probably read five of them, you know, so I've got 195 more to read, you know. So the how we spend our time is something that people don't think about. I just watched the Social Dilemma doc on Netflix last night about uh, the, the manipulation of social media. Facebook was a big part of it. And it's tough because... I use Facebook in order to connect with people, to promote myself at the same time, thinking about how they are manipulating me, you, and everybody else is scary. I even, I wrote an article on my website, Living for Likes. I wrote that five years ago and it was published in something called Privacy Journal, where I basically took other uh, information from the New York Times and other sources about social media and the manipulation, especially of Facebook. At the time, they were talking to the minister of propaganda in China, you know, and so I really kind of am aware of the manipulation of Facebook, yet I'm still on it, you know, and it's tough. Well, you know, the thing is with with social media and even since this documentary has come out, we can talk about 
the fact that it's all an algorithm. It's always an algorithm. We'll even talk about Amazon with that because I have one of my novels, uh, My Days with the Dark Muse. The paperback, they like screwing with the price. They they have at one point a few weeks ago, they had it less than the actual ebook. Right. And I'm like, how is this possible? One person bought it as soon as they bought it, the price went back up. So how do I promote this on social media if it's going to be a sale? And I have no knowledge. They have no they don't tell you it's going to be on sale. But what I'm getting at is so there's that al- algorithm. But then like on TikTok, OK, if you're pro- if you're willing to be on this app for hours a day doing so many different clips, we're going to go ahead and we're going to make your videos happen. We're going to get you on that for you page and we're you're going to be rolling through constantly. OK, I don't do that. I get on TikTok maybe once a week, maybe twice. My hits three to four hundred. Most I've ever had is a duet with somebody for twelve hundred. But I know some people that are on there daily and it affects their freaking mood. They will be OK because they're getting all these likes, they're getting all these sales. And then the next day, their next video does squat. And their mood is like, oh, nobody likes me. What are we doing to people? And you wonder why ADHD is so high. We are watching these little clips that are like this. You know, think about that. Think about if we actually stepped away from our phones. And I mean, I'm guilty of it. But if we actually stepped away and and not got distracted by our phones, and con- it goes back to the social dilemma, and not being so plugged in all the time that Dare I say, oh, the phone dinged, I better get that. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, if you ever, I mean, another example is if you ever go to a fast food restaurant, you're standing in line to order, you get up to the counter, and then you you think you're about to order, but then they start talking in the headset to the person, the drive through. Or if you ever go to a business person's office and you're you're in their office, you're in the chair, you just shook hands, the phone rings. They, they give you the one and they pick up the phone and talk to whoever's on the phone over the person that's right in front of you. And I, I notice these things about myself. And I, I do think that the younger generations, they're really in trouble because they were born and had a, a smartphone in their little hand before they could talk. You know what I mean? So yeah. uh, it's going to be interesting. Um, I went to the gym last week and as I'm, you know, going to the shower, minding my own business, you know, in my periphery vision, I see something that was a little weird in the, in another gym shower, a guy was in the gym shower with his phone in the gym shower. So the water wasn't running, but he literally was in the shower. Uh, I am assuming about to take a shower with his phone in the shower. And I mean, if you've ever, uh, well, you haven't, but in, in the men's room, you'll see guys on their phones while they're using the the urinals. It's like, come on, isn't don't you have any respect for the person on the other end of the phone? My my, two things about that: the guy in the shower, maybe he was taking unsolicited pics for future events for you know, <laughs> DMing somebody. Um, my husband actually, he uh, he he went to the bathroom one time and he's like, I just couldn't handle myself. I had to be an asshole. And I'm like, well, what happened? He's like, this guy, I'm sitting there on the phone. And all right, he's sitting there on the phone. I he wasn't, my husband wasn't, but the guy was on the phone and he's just sitting there talking. Right. And he's like, I, I started responding, and then finally I'm like, man, I really have to take a shit. And the guy's like, I gotta go. But I mean, my husband's just like, come on, it's the it's the bathroom. I have a little respect for the sanctity of what we're doing here gentlemen please come yeah on. I, I mean you don't it happens i understand you can take the call but then usually if you take that call you usually just say okay i'll call you right back you don't yeah. have a freaking conversation no i think it's it's a it's atrocious what happens in men's room as it really is which is a it's another podcast perhaps but what goes on the, the worst I'll, I'll tell you this it's not a disgusting story the worst thing I ever saw in a men's room was I went to a men's room and I had just taken a flight to Baltimore, Washington airport. And I go to the men's room after the long flight and it's packed, you know, like all these guys coming off of airplanes all over the world. And there was like a 12 year old kid standing in the middle of the restroom licking a vanilla ice cream cone. And, and I'm, I, I, I mean, it's not my kid. I don't know who this kid is, but I, I felt like taking him aside or Take me to your parents. Let's have a discussion. You don't want to be licking ice cream in the middle of the men's room. That's not 
you know, clean. It's not good. It's disgusting. But what can you do? Mm, nothing like a petri dish. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I just, it amazed me that that would happen in this day and uh, day and time. But there it was. Well, I, I think, I don't, as smart as we've gotten, I don't think we've gotten as smart as we should be. I mean, yeah. in the 80s, I had a girl, she's like, okay, we're going to go shopping and we work together. And she's like, well, I got to wash my hands. I'm like, well, we just left work. She goes, that's okay. I'm going to do it the natural way. I'm like, okay. So she's spitting her hand. Oh, boy. And then does this number. And I'm just sitting there going, okay, how is that? sanitary yeah. but, but anyway we've digressed so um so you're gonna have your you got your books i'm gonna put your podcast or your uh, youtube channel and your book up on the podcast site so all your links will be there so i take it that you are definitely happy that you move it was definitely a better two choice yeah if we, if we uh the, the basic point is you know the, the, i was happy i moved it was a better two choice I did not know that this, you know, worldwide crisis was going to happen, but I definitely know that it was the right choice because the way that this part of the country is Florida has handled things to me is a lot more freedom based than where I was. So if nothing else that came through, there's other parts to that, but that's the biggest thing. Like, uh, that ability to go see a movie or to go to a coffee shop and not get kicked out by the security guard. Um, you know, that's, that's really the win there. Okay. Well, I thank you for your time. I thank you for your time and thanks for having this great show. And I've enjoyed many of the uh, prior episodes and I will continue to on the better Two podcast. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Thanks guys for tuning into the better Two podcast. Your listenership is greatly appreciated. If you like what you hear, remember to hit subscribe. We also have our videos on YouTube. They usually post the same day as the podcast and you should check it out. If you have a question or you would like to be a guest on the show, please drop me an email and I'll be glad to talk to you about it. The email is Donna, D-A-U-N-A, at thebetter2podcast.com. Thanks again for tuning in and catch you next time.